Welcome to the We Are Libertarians presidential series. I am your host, Hody Johns, and I am joined by Libertarian candidate for president, Kim Ruff. Kim, how's it going tonight? Very well. Thank you so much for having me on, Hody. Oh, it is great to hear from you. Uh, a lot of them I've heard from before, a lot of them I haven't. You and I haven't had any personal interactions. And uh, whenever somebody gives me a phone number as a way to get in contact with somebody, I'm like, oh no, are they going to be able to <laughs> hack it on? Are they going to be able to hack it on social media? I don't know. <laughs> I was like, meet me around the corner of the Taco Bell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. We're doing this in person no matter what. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, really appreciate you joining us. Uh, so, so you were one of, the, one of the many who said, why aren't the questions just varied? And I'm ready to be blindsided. Go ahead and hit me with all of them. Uh, <laughs> so just so our listeners know, this first round, we're just getting where everybody stands on the issues so you can really do an apples to apples comparison on each of the candidates so that you know where they stand on the issues, where their priorities are. And so that's kind of the intent for this. Now, Kim, there's going to be further uh, debates interviews that you will be blindsided with questions just like you always wanted so don't worry about oh, good that. i like being put on the spot and made uncomfortable <laughs> yeah well, some people thrive on the like the improv thing i was never as good at it as some of my fellow actors but uh but some people they really make a life of it um, oh my god so you took acting classes too huh <laughs> uh theater in high school i loved it to death whenever whenever i needed a break from the academics and i'll admit i was a nerd in high school that was my one extracurricular that was not athletic or academic related i was just yeah. like i want to be in all the plays i love to act <laughs> yeah so now i pretend to be a libertarian for a living no i'm just kidding um <laughs> <laughs> so, of my life <laughs> <laughs> So, so let's get started. Um, first question, just tell us, just tell me about your personal life, politics aside, we're going to have every other question's political. So let us know about you, what you do, occupation, family, okay, history, um, let's have it. <laughs> You're like medical history? <laughs> uh, I mean, if you want. <laughs> I find that people don't won't stop you from giving too much information, and I, I as a member of the media, probably should encourage you to give me more information. But you're the presidential candidate; you decide what you want on the record, right? Okay. All right. Well, my name is Kim Ruff. That is my maiden name. My married name, although I am divorced, is Richards. I am born and raised in Arizona. I'm 37. I'll be 38 on February 28th. Um, I come from, my folks are actually one of the few families that are still married. <laughs> I have an older brother. Um, let's see, I work as an operations director for a custom plastic and steel fabrication plant that specializes in the high purity industries. So we work with the semiconductor and biomedical industries. That's what I do for a living. Um, my education is I have dual baccalaureates in communication and political science. And prior to that, I got an associate's in applied science and motion picture television. Hence why I took an acting class because I wanted to be a film critic. So that's, a, that's kind of my educational background. And then my career background, I live in Peoria, which is a suburb of the greater Phoenix megatropolis. And uh, I have two children, a daughter who's six years old, a son who is four. And I live here with my fiance, Johnny Adams, who is the host of Blast Off with Johnny Rocket and Raylene Lightheart. Yeah, uh, awesome. Uh, and that, and that uh, Johnny has some political persuasions, from what I understand as well. He has some opinions. I yeah. mean, he, you know, he's a bit of a wallflower, but he, from time to time, will articulate them <laughs> on the air loudly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, man. It, yeah. If, if, if I ever don't get the two minutes of hate, I feel like my day is a little incomplete. Um, <laughs> I love his speeches. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> <That was longer. laughs> So let's talk about your liberty journey. How did you get to the liber How do you get to libertarianism? I find that nobody's born into it. So, so what's your what's your journey to it? Okay. Um, my family, they're actually what would be considered. My folks classify themselves as Reagan Republicans, but we're from Arizona, which is Goldwater State. And I am very much, or I was, a Goldwater Republican. So when in 2005, and particularly after 9-11, we started to see the GOP shift much more to neoconservatism, become incredibly hawkish, enter into Iraq and Afghanistan with very little rationale, um, I just got really disenchanted with the GOP and disgusted with their behavior. 
And a friend of mine said, you know, based on your political views and the things that you talk about, have you ever looked into the Libertarian Party? And I said, no, what's that? So I looked them up online and I read their platform and I was like, oh, my God, these are my people. <laughs> so that's where I changed my political affiliation. But I didn't become involved in the party until about 2009 after I graduated from ASU. And the political science degree was actually sort of supplemental. I had felt, like I said, I wanted to be a film critic. So communication was to go into the journalism end of it. But I took so many electives in political science just because I found it so fascinating, particularly international relations, foreign affairs, national security, stuff like that, that they were like, you know, if you just took one more class, you could get another degree in political science. <laughs> I'm like, oh, OK. So um, in 2009, when I graduated, which was the year, incidentally, that Obama was our speaker at my graduation, and I refused to do it because I did not want to have Obama speak at my graduation, um, I kind of carpet bombed every single think tank and periodical organization that was even tangentially libertarian to see if I could get a job. And the Arizona Libertarian Party was the only one who had contacted me. And they were like, we could use somebody with your skills. <laughs> and I was like, great, how much does it pay? And they're like, nothing. <laughs> so that's kind of how I got involved. And I've been involved ever since. Awesome. It's, uh, there's a lot of volunteer work in the Libertarian Party. I'm not saying they're cheap, but uh... It's, it's a lot of volunteer work. Um, yeah. Libertarian Party is one of those places where if you're like, I would like to be a political director, they're like, you're hired. Yeah. <laughs> like, done. <laughs> you can go ahead and update your Facebook status, and that will count as your first eight paychecks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. My yeah. TV looks good. Right. <laughs> Right. Okay. Well, uh, don't get along with the Republicans. Don't get along with the Democrats. Sounds like you're well on your way there. Uh, what's yeah. the, let, let's, let's talk about the, pre, let, let's say you get the presidency. We're going to start there and we're going to count down. You're the president. Let's talk about the number one, I'm going to go one through three, but your biggest issues facing America and how does a Kim Ruff presidency take care of those biggest issues that you see facing America today? My goodness. Um, yeah, I've meditated on this a lot because I know that you had wanted to ask about our top three major issues and what we wanted to tackle. Um, they're also equivalently important, but I would say for the sake of discussion, targeting the military industrial complex that accounts for 70 percent of our budget. It has businesses that are obviously the beneficiary of crony capitalism. It's what uh, Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed Martin. Northrop Grumman um, and General Dynamics are the top five that are beneficiaries of all these huge government contracts, and they are they profit heavily off of the war machine. And because of the fact that we have, as Eisenhower warned us on his exit address, that we would be we needed to be mindful of the military industrial complex, we have since such time continued to engage in aggressive actions, trifle in other countries' affairs, and basically create the situation where. We as Americans are no longer defending the world or defending ourselves. We're not really actually making the world safe for democracy. What we're doing is terrorizing the rest of the world. And we're doing that with the assistance of Israel and some of the other coalitions that we have on the international stage. And if we really think about it from that perspective and we recognize what's happening, we realize we're not the good guys here. You know, North Korea is as not big of a threat to us as we actually make them out to be. It's a lot like 1984, where we say Oceania has always been at war with Eurasia. Much of it is saber rattling. And they do that to continue to build the war machine so that they continue to have the revenue from it. So targeting that by closing overseas bases, ending these conflicts, engaging in diplomatic relations with other nations, pulling ourselves out of supranational organizations like the United Nation, having them leave our soil, no longer participating in trade agreements, opening up free trade with other nations. You know, and of course we have the right to disassociate should we decide, but we don't aggress against anyone. I think it will help build a much healthier international stage for us. And it will mitigate the extraordinary loss of life and property that war naturally brings. So that would be probably my number one priority and it would be relevant to my role as commander in chief. That's a, an excellent point. That's something the commander in chief needs to get a hold of, and something that our last few presidents have let slip through their slip through their fingers. Uh, you mentioned the top five recipients of uh, you know government grants, government money in order to keep the military complex going. Uh, let's see here: Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, 
and Boeing are all in the top, uh, let's see, each of them pay over $250 million a year in lobbying, mm -hmm. uh, each. So if you were to even divide that among every politician, I mean, that's still an astronomical amount for each politician. I mean, it's just, it's, it's pay, they're paying a small amount to get a large amount to stay at war. I mean, it's right. just, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, all right, let's talk about problem number two and how you would fix it. Okay, well, again, relevant to my role as the president and keeping it with, in line of the scope of responsibility as defined by the Constitution for the executive branch, I think the next thing that I would probably focus on is criminal justice reform, and that would be with respect to the federal government. One of the things that really bothers me is that originally when we designed our Jeffersonian model of jurisprudence, as we call it, we had it built on the rights of Englishmen which was something that under, you know, came out of the Magna Carta. It undergirded the thinking and the rationale that every person, regardless of their position or station in society, was considered equal before the eyes of the law. And a prosecutor's job, and truly the state-based court's job, was to seek truth above all else, not to benefit itself, not to get a conviction, but to find out the truth. And in the intervening years since the establishment of our nation, we have had this systematic erosion of civil liberties. And that has come into stark relief, particularly after 9-11, where we suspended habeas corpus for anyone who was considered, quote unquote, a terrorist, which was a term we didn't even bother to define in the USA Patriot Act, which is another sticky wicket because that's something that fully <laughs> that goes way beyond the scope of responsibility of the executive branch. The USA Patriot Act should be completely repealed. But with that being said, what I would like to do is do a full scale audit of the attorney general's office and every single federal prosecutor and look at their conviction rates and the cases that they've taken on and determine if they were actually doing what they were supposed to do, which is seeking truth, regardless of innocence or guilt, but seeking capital T truth, or if they were doing it to build a career on convicting other people regardless. And if that's the case, then they would be immediately expunged, disbarred, and they would have to find a job working along all of the people they had victimized over the course of their careers. So I think criminal justice reform is a huge thing. We have the highest per capita rate of incarcerated people across the world. And a lot of them are nonviolent, you know, victimless crimes. And it's based on the drug war. So we need to end that immediately. We need to pardon. I can't do it on a state level, but I can certainly do it on a federal level. Pardon all nonviolent, victimless criminals and give them back their natural, their rights their right to participate in the electoral process, their, light, their right to no longer be considered a felon, to find you know, gainful employment. I can't give them back their lives, but I can certainly give them back their citizenship. Yeah. Uh, I mean, especially at the federal level, I think that has actually the highest rate of victimless crime uh, incarceration. Uh, I actually only know this number because I just looked it up, but 93% uh, victimless crime um, yeah. on the federal level incarcerated. And that's Countless families, I mean, just getting torn apart by some, doing something that didn't hurt anybody. Um, right. Let's look at problem number three and how you fix it. Okay, so problem number three. Um, hmm. There are so many things <laughs> that could actually be addressed, but obviously the big one that we're all talking about right now on the national scale is this question of immigration and how do we handle immigration. Now, I can completely understand the rationale where they say they don't want people who are going to be potentially hazardous to society, cause this you know, financial burden or cultural burden because they don't integrate or they don't participate or they bring their values or politics that run counter to our belief system and therefore erode ours or they benefit off of welfare. So we want to put a kibosh on that and end that. But the problem with this whole issue is that it's created by government policies and if we address those government policies, instead of trying to build a hedge around our nation, I think that that would actually address the issue. And so there are probably about five or six things that you could tap into, which is one, you want to get rid of the issues concerning illegal gangs and the whole drug trade. Then you need to absolutely end the war on drugs. That has to end because we've created a black market that we would no longer have this issue. The second thing is we need to stop taking on the Second Amendment. We should stop trying to get people's guns from them. That is what creates, again, another black market situation. So that will mitigate narcotics coming across the border and illegal firearms coming across the border. The third thing we would need to do is we need to privatize all public lands. So instead of people complaining about, well, 
you know, what do we do with these parks or what do we do with these public lands or these major areas or whatever? We don't want people just walking on them. We'll privatize it and let the person who owns the property determine whether or not they want to build a fence and, you know, put in a gun turret or something, you know? It's up to them to defend their property and determine who can and cannot pass across it. Um, the fourth thing that we would want to look at is obviously welfare. Welfare is a situation where you're robbing from every single person, putting it in a pot, and then you're giving it proportional to people's declared need. And losing 20% of it along the way, right? Right, because we obviously have to pay somebody to figure out how to portion it out. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you're getting, what, like 10 cents on the dollar, I think is like the rate of exchange on that. So we should get rid of welfare and encourage more community development, not through government policies, but just through building up our own communities as libertarians and engaging in charitable, voluntary relationships with people. And that is something that we can do. And probably the fifth thing, and this, this is debatable, and we can all hash this out in a dialogue, sponsorship is actually something that we used to do, which is we used to have people in the community, particularly during World War II, where we would say, okay, I know this family who wants to immigrate from Germany, and I can vouch for them. And if there's any issue that comes up with this family, that's on me. I take care of them. I'll look out for them. I will make sure that they have a place to live, that they are not a burden to society. So sponsorship is something to actually look at. I know that there, one of the things that we would say sometimes is that you don't have the right to curtail the free movement of people. And that's true, you don't. But in a totally anarcho-capitalist society where all land is privatized, people don't have the freedom of movement. It would be trespassing if they just went across land. So you deal with that by permitting people to have private property and then having sponsorship where people take personal responsibility for those individuals. And I think that if we did that, we would, again, build up the community and erode government and that need for them to fix our problems. So that's my third thing. Yeah, a six-step program for your third most important thing. That's impressive. <laughs> that's impressive. Um, well, yeah, the seventh <laughs> step is we find all the people we've hurt and we apologize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, the apology tour, that went over well for Obama. Yeah. Uh, no. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's, let's back up from the presidency and let's just talk about getting elected. Let's say you've already won the primary. We're going against public, or, you know, you're going against presumably Donald Trump and whoever the Democrats, uh, throw up there. So I'm going to break this down kind of faction by faction within the Republicans and Democrats, because let, even if you take a hundred percent of the libertarian vote, you get 13 to 16% at, at best. Yeah, if 100% of them show up at the polls. So let's talk about polling from these other parties here and, and why they would support you. So let's start with, let's start with social issues first and let's talk about the social liberals. Okay. And they, they're concerned about gay marriage. They're concerned about the disparity in our communities between minorities and whites. They're concerned about differentiation in the workplace and, and handicap access and how would how would you appeal to them on the social level more than the candidate that they nominated to put up well to be quite honest if their if their solution to these concerns of theirs is government i'm not going to appeal to them they're not going to like what i have to say but what they should be endorsing and what they should recognize is that government doesn't have a right to make any determination about how people choose to structure their family or who they choose to love and what covenants or relationships they choose to enter into. That's never something that should have any business, and that should be the appropriate answer regarding gay marriage. Secondly, with respect to discrimination laws, I think all of those should absolutely be repealed because they're creating an unfair advantage. They are disrespecting the uniqueness and the merit of each individual by looking at them to, like, looking at them as a statistic or as an identity, independent of their own unique character traits and capabilities. And in so doing, they are creating something where we have a weakened economy and we have people in positions that they really weren't appropriate for just in order to fill out a quota. So discrimination laws should be absolutely repealed. Affirmative action should be absolutely repealed. Additionally, I think everybody has a right to discriminate. I think businesses absolutely should have a right to say, I don't wish to have this individual or this group or have you come on my property with firearms or whatever criteria they wish to establish because private property rights trump all. Granted, they will lose business and they will have to make a choice. Do I want to continue to discriminate against certain groups and classes of people or do I want to open it up in order to be economically profitable? But 
your property, your rules. And that should be the case always. So when you end up using government to make a law to restrict the rights of other people, invariably, it will come to pass that that same law will be used against you. So if you want to encourage healthier relationships with people or tackle on discrimination, the best way to do it is vote with your paycheck and not endorse businesses that engage in policies you don't personally agree with. That will force their hand and they will have to choose to pivot or die. You know, they, uh, uh, Ray Kroc, when he founded McDonald's, was like, why would I not serve black people? I'm aware I don't have to, but why would I, why would I cut out a huge chunk of money that I can get? I mean, I, I, I don't understand why it's bad business. And it was even dying even before the uh, civil rights act. And, and I'm, I understand the civil rights act and, and it did some good things as well as, you know, tread on a few property rights. But um, I kind of understand, I understand a, a little bit of the argument there when you just say, you know, I think the free market is probably going to fix most of this. Uh, right. Attempting to eradicate all of it at the government level usually makes it worse instead of better. But uh, Right, because right, there's always going to be that sort of contrarian nature where we dig in and push back. Like, don't tell us what to do. When if we had it more as the collective action, you know, which is the invisible hand of the marketplace, when we, through our individual decision making, move that culture or shift that pendulum, then it's much more organic, it's healthier, and society is better off for it. So you can never force a good idea. It is something that will happen organically through the free market. Sure. Um, all right, let's move on to the social conservatives now. Let's say they're <laughs> concerned about traditional marriage. They're concerned you've already addressed immigration, but a little bit of that. Um, we're tired of getting our, they say you can't have a church visible from, you know, or cross visible from your church if the church is visible from a highway. And they're thinking about taxing churches now. Um, um, and that's kind of what I'm scared of as a social conservative. Why would they be more satisfied with you than Donald Trump? Well, um, Again, kind of like the social liberals, if their answer to what their concerns are is government, they won't like me. But they should like me because I firmly believe that your good government begins with you. That the family unit, regardless of its composition, but the family unit, the neighborhood, the community, building that relationship on that level is the last bulwark against tyranny. We have gotten to a situation where we've had people pull away from their relationship with each other. They're much more disconnected. Like we have, it's very bizarre because we're incredibly connected through the internet with each other, but we're very isolated and disconnected from our immediate neighbors. There's a lot of people who tell you, I have no idea who's on my city council. I've never been to a meeting. I don't know who are the people that live within, you know, a quarter mile radius of me, unless maybe they use the next door app, but that won't even tell you what their names are anymore. <laughs> So, you know, we're very, we are increasingly disconnected from one another. And in so doing, when we see something that bothers us about society, like I'm concerned about the homeless, our immediate response now is instead of banding together with our neighbors and maybe collecting food and, you know, or going to a soup kitchen and helping out, our answer is, you know, I'm going to vote for a candidate who's going to take more of my money and my neighbor's money and use it to help this problem. So if we recognize the value of community and the value of local relationships and the family. And we recognize that it is incumbent upon us as libertarians. We are huge advocates for personal responsibility. So if it's incumbent upon us to engage in that positive behavior, then we can stem the tide of tyranny because we're no longer looking at government to solve our existential crises. And, you know, for those of you who do believe church is absolutely one of those non-governmental organizations that is an answer to it, just as a charitable organization is or a 501c3 nonprofit. So that is something the social conservatives should like, but I do not believe in legislating morality. I think that is not the role of government at all. So if you, you know, again, this comes back to the right to disassociate. If there are certain things that you don't personally like, don't you personally do it, and don't you personally associate with people who do things you disagree with. But don't make government tell others how to live their lives. Sure. The, um, it's sad because a lot of those candidates that you talk about them voting for oftentimes make it then illegal to take care of the, the homeless on their own or, right. or, you know, for a church and, or to feed them or whatever like that. So let's move on to economy now. Um, and let's, again, let's start with the left, right order, the economic left. I am sick of seeing big governments get, or, you know, big uh, corporations get these tax breaks 
and we're always picking on the poor in their food stamps and we're not looking at, at, at these big businesses and they aren't paying their fair share. And why would I be more drawn to a Kim Ruff presidency than I would to one of my Democrat presidencies? Okay. Well, the, with social, okay. So socially economic people or economic liberals or however you want to classify them, they are halfway right, which is they're frustrated by the fact that they see these corporations getting all these kickbacks from the government. And then they're like, down with capitalism. But what they're conflating is legitimate a free market economy, which we do not have, with crony capitalism, which is what they're observing and why it's so negative. They're looking at these businesses that have benefited from huge government subsidies and tax breaks and have benefited from having lobbyists in the pocket of politicians who make rules and regulations that penalize competition and give them an unfair advantage and thus allow them a monopoly on the marketplace. So they're frustrated by that because they feel like big business is out there to, you know, destroy the little guy. And to some extent, that is. But in a legitimately free market system, which is what we should have, which is done by repealing all those rules and all those regulations and ending subsidies and tax breaks for companies, a company that has a successful business model and a superior product and or service is going to naturally rise to the top because consumers will re recognize their inherent value and patronize them accordingly. So there will be much more competition in a free market economy. And I think that, you know, economic liberals need to understand that while they're frustrated with what they are, what they're mad about is crony capitalism. And that absolutely needs to end. But it doesn't mean that capitalism or a free market economy is not a good thing. A free market is an amazing thing. And we wouldn't have these huge peaks and deep valleys if we didn't have central banking making these decisions for us and we didn't have the government tampering with it. We would go through the normal ebb and flow of a legitimate free market economy with much less disturbance and much less pain, particularly for the poorest of us. Yeah, the um, yeah, I agree. Uh, so let's look at economic conservatives then. They're constantly going after my, my employer, trying to make their taxes higher. Um, it seems like the government keeps growing all the time and there's no end in sight. And the only thing I even care about them, you know, the government doing is defending me and the Democrats are always going after defense. And I'm sick of the people on welfare constantly dragging down the system. I'm speaking, of course, as a conservative and not as, as myself. But what would you, what, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm well, I'm well versed on, on how to do this. this that's my speech in debate cast. Like, right. Like <laughs> Poor ratio. I hardly knew. You. Yeah. Um, so what's yeah uh, acting? Uh, so what is what's the Kim Ruff solution? How would you appeal to those people who are probably naturally drawn to some guy guy like a Donald Trump? Why would they consider the libertarian Kim Ruff candidate instead? Well, again, I'm I'm a huge advocate for a free market economy. So that means that elimination of rules and regulations that hamper businesses and stymie competition, as well as elimination of subsidies and tax breaks that give an unfair advantage to other businesses. That's something that I'm absolutely a proponent of. And I think that I, I don't see how you could be a legitimate, economically conservative person and not appreciate that stance. If you don't, then maybe you need to rethink what your ideology actually is. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, all right, so let's go. Let let's let's leave that behind, uh, and let's let's work on getting there now. Let's work uh, back from the election. Now let's work on surviving your own primary. Okay. Let's focus on libertarians and talk about how you rally them around you. So we'll go left, right, extreme, center on this as well, and we'll just say the 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 libertarian left, the libertarian socialists, the mutualists. Mike Shipley, Matt Kino, Sam Coppinger, uh, whoever else they may be, they have their concerns. What's your biggest appeal to the libertarian left in order to get you through a primary, why they should support you instead of one of the other candidates? Well, um, hmm. I guess it depends on how you define socialism. I think that's one of those words, kind of like radicalism, which it has its own connotation and therefore can be very pejorative. Socialism, as it has been explored in the wider political arena, is a political and economic ideology that is for central planning, is for government intervention. 
Now, left-leaning libertarians who self-describe, who uh, self-identify as socialist, typically are proponents of a communalistic relationship, which is 100% voluntary. However, there are some people within the Libertarian Socialist Caucus who are outspoken advocates for things like universal basic income and universal health care because they figure if you're going to have the devil you know, then it might as well be to my benefit, which is, of course, pardon my French, bullshit. You should never, ever advocate for the government doing anything, and just because that one happens to benefit you doesn't mean that the oppression is any better. So if that is something you're an advocate for, then you're not legitimately a libertarian and you're in the wrong damn party. Now, if you are an advocate for voluntary relationships that are more communalist and you want to engage in bartering or something that's much more like helpful to one another, and maybe it's on a small scale, but you're not going to try and push your agenda onto other people should they not desire it, then that's fine. And I think that they shouldn't have an issue there. Awesome. I hope that, hope that helps explain, explain it. it. By the no, way, that way makes sense. my understanding, Mr. Matt, I guess you're no longer a libertarian. libertarian so. <laughs> oh no, the purity test comes up. Uh, no, you know. <laughs> no, I think he actually quit the party. Oh, oh sorry, so say that, that again. What, I, I think he quit the party. I had heard. heard. Okay. The uh, I, I did hear about that about him, but. Um, Let's see. Uh, George Orwell was a uh, socialist and he's the biggest voice against socialism, but he was a voluntary socialist. So I. Right. Which is totally fine. If it's a voluntary relationship, I mean, that's the linchpin. If it doesn't engage in force or fraud, you're not trying to compel other people to action. It is a, something that you all voluntarily agree on and it's mutualism. Fine. I got no issue with it. Awesome. All right. So let's talk about the right. That one, you kind of got the capitalists, a few ANCAPs. Uh, you got the Michael Heises, the Mises Caucus, the Joshua Smiths, um, those guys. How, how would the Kim Ruff presidency appeal to someone who's more of the, the right-minded libertarian mindset? Well, as I said, I'm very much a proponent of the free market economy. I am a capitalist myself, which is to say that in the classically defined sense, not as we've seen it observed and play out in our country, because it's some sort of weird conflation of crony capitalism and democratic socialism. So what we have is not a legitimate free market system, and that needs to be understood and made clear. Um, I am personally a very socially conservative person, which is not to say that any of my belief system is going to manifest in government policies. It's just how I conduct myself, how I live my life who I am as a parent, as a, as a partner, I'm very socially conservative. So I'm sure that I would probably appeal more, possibly on a normative level, to the right libertarians, just because they might see me as less scary on a, on a sort of visual sense. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't see how those policies would, would be in conflict at all with right libertarianism. Awesome. Um, all right, let's talk about the libertarian. And let's go with the extremists, the anarchists, the purists, the, the no government. A lot of times they even have a problems even voting, but they do show up. You know, some of them have embraced it well enough to, to, to show up with the libertarian functions. And they really have a, probably the loudest voice as far as who's running for president within the libertarian party. What's your appeal to someone who's of the anarchist mindset? Uh, why why would they like you more than the rest? That's the part where I got to go like that. <laughs> I'm an anarchist. <laughs> no, I'm very much an anarchist. My answer to everything is always going to be look at the free market or permit individual relationships or the community to decide. And it's never, ever going to default to what can government do for us? Now, granted, and mind you, and this is something that needs to be made incredibly clear. I am fully cognizant of the scope of work that's involved in the office that I'm running for. I know precisely what that position entails and what was defined by the Constitution and its limitations. And I have no desire to work beyond the scope of that office because that's something that has been done since pretty much our inception and has totally destroyed our nation. So my goal is only to do exactly what's permissible in the constitutionally defined parameters of that position. That being said, my answer to every single question is going to be, how can we do it without government? And that's, I think, a really good thing, because for a very long time, for example, when we talk about taxes, we say, should we raise taxes or should we lower them? Should we adjust them here or should we adjust them there? And it's always this taxes are a thing and you have to accept it. Nobody ever says, do, what, do we really need to tax at all? Is that something that we should be doing? So maybe having somebody who says, do we really need government doing this is actually a very, very good thing. Now, as far as my non-voting anarchist brethren, please, guys, 
I understand your rationale that voting is aggression. And you're absolutely right that we do live in a tyrannical system. That being said, it is the one that we have. And if we're going to fight back and not have a revolution, then you probably need to get out and vote. The uh, two things you brought up. One is I say, what's the difference between someone who protests and doesn't vote and stays at home and is too lazy to vote? <laughs> um, one of them voted for a, gor a gorilla. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Harambe got a few votes. That's right. And then, um, oh, man, you brought up something else. Uh, oh, Obama said his biggest regret was leaving a smoking gun or a, a loaded gun in the White House for the next president. I mean, he even said that, that was his biggest regret. And right. so you look at, I think it's very important that you know the scope of the office because you could say, I could do all these crazy things. And now we look at Trump declaring a national emergency for mm -hmm. building the wall. And you say, well, that's something that the next president, now that's a bullet in his, whoever, he, he or she's next next gun that you hand that gun off to now has that ammunition to use that in some other perverted way. Exactly. In the, just with respect to that position, as you very well know, I'm sure, the original intent, as defined by the Constitution, was that the legislative branch was the only branch that was responsible for actually creating legislation. And they were supposed to make sure that they fleshed it out fully, it was defined, and then it was incumbent upon the executive branch to, as the name suggests, execute the legislation. They are the enforcement arm of the legislation. The judiciary exists strictly to determine whether or not it's constitutional. And if it isn't, it's supposed to be overturned. Executive orders were only ever created to deal with the inner workings of the executive branch. They were never supposed to be supplemental or auxiliary legislative capabilities. And yet we have continually abused the executive orders to do so. And you see now, particularly with legislature, not defining certain policies or pieces, that the enforcement arm of the state, the executive branch, their federal agencies are deciding what that actually means and making a determination and sort of sort of cherry picking. OK, you're in violation of this law because I'm interpreting this very open ended clause to mean X, Y, Z. So they're punishing people based on very ill defined language done by the legislature and the executive branch is taking upon themselves to start legislating from that position. These are no longer separate but equal and checks and balances type systems. And one of the biggest things I would want to do is overturn every single executive order ever issued if it extends beyond the scope of what that office, office is supposed to be doing. But then the Clintons and Trumps would go to jail. Oops. Oh, how about I that? I mean, you, know, you commit a crime. <laughs> Don't commit a crime if you can't do it the time, baby. All right. Uh, let's talk about the... <laughs> let's talk they about the like, you know what this isn't that nice i don't know why we keep sending people here <laughs> yeah boy yeah <laughs> taste of the own medicine on that one um right. let's talk about the moderates they're the ones who generally actually choose the president they've given us gary johnson they probably were going to give us bill weld they're going to give a uh, they already gave us uh, bob Barr. they're the ones who classically show up at the the convention and they're the ones who send the most delegates and they're the ones they think that change comes in a suit uh what is your best appeal to the moderate the minarchist members of the party that you're the right person for them well i think uh, no offense to my my competition that is also an anarchist because I do have a lot of respect, particularly for, you know, Arvind Vora. I have a lot of respect for them and their positions. I think the fundamental difference between me and some of my competitors and other anarchists is that they're not also pragmatic, which is to say that they talk about, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to systematically decentralize the government. I'm going to get rid of all these things that I actually cannot technically get rid of because that's not what the president does. And I understand actually what the president does. I studied government. I know how it functions. And I know that if you want to accomplish something, you have to work within the set parameters. And again, like you were talking about the smoking gun, if you push beyond the appropriate bounds of a position, you set a dangerous precedent. It might benefit you today, but it's going to bite you in the butt tomorrow. And that is not something I want to do. I would like to be able to get in there and affect as much positive change as I reasonably can and encourage things to go back to a state and local level and ideally, ultimately, to the individual. But again, that's up to the states and localities to decide, not my job. And encourage this socio-political sea change so that people who follow after me 
continue on in this vein and they don't push beyond the bounds of what's defined. So I think that's something that would possibly be very appealing to people who are more moderate if they think that an anarchist is a scary thing or they think that somebody who is an advocate for strictly looking at the free market to decide is a scary thing. I recognize exactly what position I'm running for and what I can and cannot reasonably do. And that is all I'm going to do and nothing greater. Gotcha. Mm. Awesome. Um, okay. So, so let's, okay. What makes you the best? Let's compare you to everybody else who's running so far and let's just keep it general. Why are you the best <laughs> libertarian candidate for all libertarians? Why, why, why are you better than anybody else who's, who's declared so far? Well, truthfully, if a if my fellow candidates are advocates for strong libertarian principles and speaking that message boldly and unapologetically, then the only difference between me and them is largely a matter of, you know, visuals, reputation, um, background, and delivery. Is that's really what it is? That's the only fundamental difference. And then at that point, it's up to the delegates to decide what they prefer and who they think you know, would be the best representative for them. Um, if they are not advocating for libertarian principles and they're not doing so boldly and unapologetically, then they're not really a libertarian. And that's the difference between me and them. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, more of that purity talk. I don't know, Kim. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very well-defined philosophy. There is no mixed message about what we as libertarians believe. So either you are or you aren't. You can have libertarian leanings, and I'm happy for you. I'm glad that you're here because that means that's one more person who's thinking about and talking about and putting forth those ideas. But continue to allow your mind to learn and understand fully what we believe in. That's the only thing that I ask. And it's not about who is the one true pure or, you know, what's the one true Scotsman fallacy or whatever because – Let's be honest, there's like only one person and he's probably dead. <laughs> <laughs> the last Scotsman has fallen, everybody. Um, <laughs> so do you want, uh, so let, let's talk nuts and bolts as we're winding down here. What, I've worked on a campaign before at the presidential level. I'm not proud of it like you as an ex-Republican. Uh, and I put a lot of time and effort into it. And I find that the president's job is like 90% raising money and the other 10% or the other 9% uh, spending time with important people and making business trips and talking with locals and the other 1% is sleeping. So <laughs> <you're>, <laughs> when we talk about the, the, your plan, do you have a plan in place to make that happen if if indeed you're selected to get the money to get the revenue to mm -hmm. meet with the people that you need to meet with let's hear what that plan is for you well i love babies so i'm glad to kiss them <laughs> no no jokes aside i mean i do love babies and i will totally like hold your kid <laughs> but um yeah the the best way that our campaign is doing this is a, it's a couple of different things and this is what makes us so very unique first of all both john and i i mean we're running as a slate which is practically unheard of because as you very well know when it comes to convention time the delegates will select independently of one another who they wish their presidential and who they wish their, wish their vice presidential candidate are going to be so that's a rather odd thing on top of that we are activists first not candidates we you know john has run for office multiple times the only time i ever proper ran for office was as a write-in candidate for state mine inspector because i was the only person in the libertarian party who qualified for that weird position here in arizona so um gay manufacturing so yeah. <laughs> i know i know things <laughs> is, is he gonna go by john on the slate i need to know this this is important john phillips oh no. yeah yeah, no, no. Are you thinking Johnny? I'm like thinking Johnny. Johnny. <laughs> oh no. no, I didn't. I didn't know this. This is news to me. Okay, so oh, you no, and no, John no. Phillips are running yeah, John, as yeah. president, so, vice president combination. Correct. Yeah. So okay. we're running as a slate, and the reason why we're doing that is is because as activists who have worked on previous presidential can campaigns, I worked for Daryl Perry um, as his communications director in 2016, and then I worked as the event coordinator here in Arizona for Gary Johnson. Um, is recognizing that it is. One of the biggest struggles that we've ever had with our presidential candidates as libertarians is feeling like they're kicking the love back to us. 
both as activists on the ground and recognizing our down ticket candidates who actually are the ones who have the highest probability of getting elected and affecting positive change in office. So many times during 2016, for example, when they were making campaign stops, they would completely snub the libertarian candidates and instead go glad hand some GOPers. So one of our big things is, first of all, it's not really about me and John. Not really. I mean, yes, we're the, the people out front and we're putting our face out there, but it's about the message. It's about what we believe is libertarians, what libertarianism is and how that manifests in policies and programs. So that's one. And because of that, then that means that it doesn't just have to be me and John talking about these things. So we have this amazing campaign team that is growing exponentially all the time. I mean, we've got people lined out in every single state as directors who have their own teams. that are building up this groundswell of momentum, not because of me and John, but because they're libertarians and they want to represent libertarianism. So at any convention, at any event, they are constantly going to be talking about libertarianism. What does it mean? What is the message? What are we fighting for? Who is it that's here locally that is doing amazing things and representing it and being our standard bearer? So that's one of the huge things that we're going to do in order to get out as much as possible. Additionally, you can do so much thanks to the Internet and, you know, access to digital capabilities where, you know, as you very well know, you're currently in Utah. I'm here in Arizona. We're having a whole conversation and people are going to see it. So I can't necessarily be at every single convention, but I can certainly do something like Skype or do a pre-recorded message or have surrogates who are great representatives of libertarianism there. So as far as money goes, we are collecting money. We're taking donations. Our website just went live. So we are going to basically build as many direct relationships as we can with as many people as we can. And if they support what we're doing and they want to encourage not just us as, you know, these functional figureheads for this message, but the 10% that we're going to be kicking back financially to the down ballot candidates, then they can donate to us and assist in this movement. But this is greater than just two knuckleheads running for office. This is people who are saying this is what libertarianism is, and it's time that we fight back. Awesome. So that actually feeds right into my very last question, which is I've heard this interview. I really like Kim Ruff or really don't like Kim Ruff and really want to get a hold of her. And <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. I, I love to talk. Yeah. And <laughs> – <laughs> or I want to get involved with the campaign or I want to donate. Like, let, give us where we go to get in touch with you and your campaign if we're curious about your presidency. Okay. So you can find us on the interwebs at roughphillips2020.com or .org. They all roll into the same website. So that's R-U-F-F-P-H-I-L-L-I-P-S 2020.com. Additionally, you can find us on Facebook at Kim Ruff slash John Phillips for POTUS and V POTUS in 2020. That's our Facebook landing page, and that is handled by our totally awesome communications team. And there is a huge group of people who are on our team that are working for us. If you want to volunteer, Aaron Pyle Metters and Michelle McCutcheon are our two liaisons there. Our campaign manager is Emily Hurtley. Our political director, so if you are interested in writing policy pieces, is Jared Hall. We have an awesome, awesome team, mm -hmm. and they're so easy to get a hold of. It blows my mind. I've, I have talked to, like, every single person on your staff except for you. I don't know how this is the first time, like, because I just... <laughs> How we haven't like crossed wires at some point because you mentioned these names and I'm like, I know who that is. Mm -hmm. Like we talk all the time on Facebook. So I, that's funny. Yeah, actually, as far as Facebook goes, I, I, I killed my social media account <laughs> again. <laughs> that's totally fair. We on uh, We're Libertarians actually had a big uh, book club episode where they talked about downscaling it and we are in the process of that. So are you trying to get off of Facebook totally? Well, some some of us are. In fact, uh, we had two people outright quit uh, for the staff to just get off of the Facebook entirely. They're still in the messenger because that's how we converse back and forth. Yeah, that's how we yeah. tell the whole, give the group whole messages. Um, I've limited myself to only being on at certain times of the day um, and just say, you know, I've got these hours to respond to people, but other than that, I need to get out of what I'm doing here. I think... <laughs> arguing is so fun <laughs> it's a great time and and dude on days when i mess up it's usually because somebody on the internet is wrong and i have to fix it right now. it's terrible 
<laughs> it's terrible, but you know, that, that's, that's the way it goes. But uh, you know, it's um, let's see here. Uh, ben Sass actually wrote a book called them, which is kind of an attack on social media and what we're doing. He's a U.S. Senator and he didn't need social media or to even have an account in order to win an election. So for me, I was like, it, it, you, you have this internal feeling that life is passing you by when you're not on social media. And the opposite is true. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm really kind of trying to realize that more and more. But uh, I, It's I, so weird because, you know, I've killed my Facebook account mm-hmm. four times since I was 24. So that's Zom- 13 years. Zombies keeps coming back from the dead. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I mean, I'll proper delete it. I don't even deactivate it. Like I delete it and yeah. I'll have a good stretch of time, like maybe a year or two years or whatever, where I'm not on it and then I'll get back on it. And it's like so thrilling to be like, how have you been? I haven't talked to you in two years. And then you kill your Facebook account again. And there's only like five or six people who consistently talk to you outside of that. And you're like, well, maybe that's a good thing. Cause I can't love all of you. It's really hard. Right. <laughs> Well, and I had the horrifying realization that I don't eat, my family's not even at the top of my feed anymore. Like it's always these other people that I'm interacting. It's like a political operative system, which is fine, but that's not social. That's not social media. That's not social media. That's, yeah. I'm not even socializing. I'm advertising because I'm a member of the media. It's right. media using a social platform. It's yeah, it's, it's, I, you know, I'm getting way sidetracked. I told you that was the last question there, but uh, Kim Ruff, I, I really appreciate you coming on the program. Like I said, this is going to be a whole series. I'm sure you get invitation to all those things too, uh, because you're so excited to get ambushed with questions. So I'll, I'll <laughs> do my best to dig up as much dirty laundry as I can on you. Uh, but <laughs> I'll give it to you. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, okay, you'll give us your white water. Fantastic. That that yeah. saves me a lot of steps. <laughs> I got nothing to hide. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much again for coming on the show. Uh, listeners, if you uh, appreciated and enjoyed this, please continue to throw us a share, throw us a like, share us around on Facebook, uh, especially if you're excited about Kim. That's how people know more about who she is, is by clicking and finding out about her. They find out who's running for president. Those are always, uh, those always get like eight times more hits than any of the rest of our podcasts. So don't feel like you're sharing it into the darkness. It needs to be heard. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that, that, that is that. Thank you so much for listening and you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Hody. I really appreciate your time. <laughs>